All these people thirst for knowledge, and they could get it from a device which ruthlessly demands the attention of millions, a machine capable of slinging images and sounds into every home in the land. TV could teach you a new language, parade the entirety of history in front of your face, or it could simply distract you with brightly coloured bibble. We all want to fill our brains with information, yet only few of us know as much as we think we know. How much do you know? What, the whole thing? About 20%, 25%. Okay. What did everyone in the world do yesterday? I don't know. You don't know any of that, do you? No. How many atoms are there in the floorboards you're standing on? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Maybe we never really learned anything from TV, but were simply transfixed by it, like apes dazzled by technology. This week, how TV ruins your life by trying to actually tell you stuff. Don't say it didn't. It did. I'm going on a journey. A journey to find out just how much I've learned from television. It's a journey that will take me the length and breadth of part of the country over a period of time. Sorry, I've just remembered I, I don't know I don't know how to drive. What's that? I can't drive. This is this isn't this isn't my car. I'm not qualified to drive. Along the way, I'll be overcoming obstacles and doing my best to appear thoughtful, as though I'm coming to some sort of realisation about the visual language through which TV experts impart their knowledge and not just staring stupidly out of a window. I'm hoping that pulling a thoughtful face will make me look like a proper documentary type, like Andrew Marr, seen here stylishly walking around America in a load of fascinating linking sequences shot for a clever politics documentary. He walks around and he stops and looks at things and thinks for a bit and then walks out of shot and then he marches like a terminator looking for a toilet, striding upstairs, gliding through sliding doors, getting reflected in glass and all the time he looks really rather profound even when he's just having a piss against a wall. I hope I look that convincing as I walk into this railway station. Television is a bit like a busy railway terminus, filled with competing streams of information bustling hither and thither, each of them capable of snaking out in different directions, much like branch lines. Well, no, of course it isn't really, but that gave me something vaguely philosophical to say over these pedestrian shots of me getting onto a train where I start my journey by looking intently at a newspaper because the world of TV knowledge basically started with the news. Early news broadcasts were stern announcements from the authorities consisting of little more than still photographs and explanatory diagrams backed with a vocal summary. The BBC Newswallers believed moving pictures would distract the viewer and prevent them from absorbing the informational content. Gradually, TV news loosened up and began to realise the advantages it had over newsprint. Unlike their desperate medieval ink and paper counterparts, TV reporters could use the moving image to make otherwise mundane stories more interesting and immersive. This filthy smoke and chemical smog is again attacking the people for whom there's most danger, the people with chest and heart troubles. The translation of news into TV grew more sophisticated. The newsroom arrived, there were more interesting graphics, and instead of a letters page, Fox pops with the public. Can I interrupt you, Tick? Do your prices up a lot? Yes, sir. Our prices are up on according to the transport and difficulties in getting it and us pulling our guts out to fetch it to the public on their table. And when major events occurred, the printing press was left standing by television, which could interrupt you in your own home to depress the arse off you. Over to the newsroom. The death of John F. Kennedy happened in Dallas at 25 past 12. And what's more, rather than reading wordy dispatches from overseas war reporters, TV viewers could follow the journalists into the thick of the action. They didn't even wait for the gunfire to stop before filing their reports. It's heavy artillery support for the Americans, and because... Because of this, they're not immediately likely to lose out here. TV news grew even more dynamic as colour television arrived, making events seem increasingly vivid and dispiriting and brutal and all horrible like. Unless, like me, you enjoy a nice violent riot with a lovely shepherd's pie and a glass of chocolate milk. Riot police were extremely fierce. Often... <laughs> it happened ages ago, it's funny. <laughs> Faced with a medium that made current affairs more exciting, newspapers were forced to zhuzh up their own content, downplaying their comparatively dry news material and adding frothy piffle, which was proudly and exhaustively trumpeted in the gaudy adverts of the time. Uncanny. Unbelievable. 
This man claims a Welsh housewife under hypnosis returned to six previous lives. Can this be so? The amazing evidence in tomorrow's Sunday Mirror. Tommy Steele reveals the agony of staying at the top. And girls, how to get your man. A dozen ways to look more sexy. Plus win this dream outfit in the marvellous Sunday Mirror tomorrow. But television wasn't content to simply provide a window on the world to show what was happening now. It had grander ambitions. It wanted to show you the whole of civilization. Landmark documentary serials such as Civilization and the epic The Ascent of Man turned your TV into a home-based lecture theatre, but a bit less boring than I've made that sound. The Ascent of Man in particular was a huge achievement. Filmed over three years, it whisked the viewer around the globe in the company of warm, erudite academic Jacob Bronowski, who explained the history of mankind's scientific advancement using a deft combination of eloquent monologues, pioneering computer graphics, and an intelligent use of imagery to make education fun. As well as landmark documentaries about real events, there were landmark dramas based on real events. When TV turned history into drama, it cast Shakespearean actors and dressed them like tapestries, and even though it was cheap and stagey, it was somehow convincing. I mean, that's barely a tree. That's not outdoors, but bloody hell, that might be Henry VIII. Television's mix of compelling fact and authentic drama was instructing viewers of all ages. Television started instructing me back when I was a kiddie week. Occasionally a TV would be wheeled into the classroom, a bit like a robot teacher. And this was exciting because it didn't feel like school. It felt like a break from school. Even if the programme you were watching was boring, it was better than being bored by a live human being. With their storybook visuals and focus on primary concepts, schools programmes were an attempt to subtly plant fresh questions in Kitty Wink's minds. Questions they'd never considered before. Hello. Have you ever thought how important numbers are? No. Have you ever noticed how interesting human faces are? No. Have you tried looking at yourself in a kettle since last week? Oh, yeah, actually I have. The trouble is the presenter's methodical basic use of language is inherently creepy. Yes. Today. It's a bit like you're coming round from a brain injury and they're a bunch of well-meaning nurses sent to rehabilitate you. Hello. Did you comb your hair when you got up this morning? I forgot, so I'm doing it now. And I'm not sure why, but for some reason, whenever I watch them, I feel a bit like I'm a homicide detective and they're a suspect trying to act natural. Hello. I didn't expect to see you. The shop's not open, I'm afraid. You can see what I'm doing if you like. Oh, yeah. Where were you on the night of the 6th? And if the presenters weren't creepy enough, their various puppety animated co-stars were downright petrifying. Let's go in. Woo! Get out! Whenever your TV turns into an instructive words and pictures light show like this, there's something faintly sinister about it. What with the haunting music and visuals and the faintly medicated air of some of the presenters, I think the only thing I learnt was to intrinsically mistrust everyone and everything on television. Why don't you draw a picture of something that really frightens you? Yeah, all right. What does, it, what does a vagina look like? But while school's programmes were unintentionally frightening, it's worth reflecting, as I sit here, that television often deliberately used fear-mongering means to train younger viewers to look after themselves. In 1977, rural areas of the UK were treated to Apaches, very much the citizen cane of terrifying educational films. This 50-minute summer holiday snuff fest told the story of a gaggle of young dimbos who repeatedly go to play on a local farm, despite the fact that one of them dies there every bloody day. Like all good movies, Apache's had its own trailer, seen here squashing one of the cast. A few years after Britain's rustic kids stared at carnage in horror, across the pond, children were subjected to an even more terrifying and lurid kind of warning. This is my future? It is if you don't get off those drugs! Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue is the powerful story of a teenager dealing with drug and alcohol abuse. Some of your favourite cartoon characters will help you understand how drugs and alcohol can ruin your life. me, I want some heroin. This crude alarmist TV propaganda was a bad trip for millions of American kids. Of course, we didn't get to see that on this side of the pond, which is why we're all so well adjusted. But we were exposed to moral instruction from some of their other cartoons. For instance, almost every line of dialogue in the garish epic Thundercats seemed to be jammed with so much heavy-handed moral guidance, it's amazing there was any room at all for the vowels and consonants. Rules are only meaningful if people agree to follow them. Otherwise, they're just words. I'll go and edit The Guardian. 
but perhaps the most strident moral supervision was smuggled inside the animated epic He-Man, which was preachier than nine priests glued to a schoolmaster and which regularly culminated in a philosophical lecture from one of its stars. As we've just seen, Skeletor went back into the past to make evil things happen. In reality, no one can go back into the past. That's only make-believe. Don't patronise me, I'm not stupid, although I am 39 and bickering with He-Man. But we can try to learn from the past, from things that have happened to us. I'd love to know what happened to make you dress like that. I'm guessing something with his uncle. Of course, we fondly remember He-Man because we learnt so much from it. Just as we fondly remember the cartoon based on uh, Terry Wogan's chat show from the 80s. Everyone remembers that. Just ask the man in the street. Do you remember the Wogan cartoon in the 80s? The Wogan cartoon? No, I don't. But I remember the cartoons in the 80s in my day was uh, Thundercats. Jason the World Warriors, Scooby-Doo Mysteries. Ah. Uh, but the, the Wogan thing was, a, it was like an animated version of Terry Wogan's chat show. It was called Wogan. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? Thinking about it, yeah, I do actually remember that now. I think, I think it was on CITV. Wogan. In today's story, we heard the actress Lorraine Chase explain how people often judge her because of her Cockney accent. They treat her as though she's simple, even though before becoming a model she invented the communication satellite, the shoe tree, and even the laser cow. <laughs> Lorraine is living proof that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Even a talking book with heavy mascara. What about one in a ten-gallon hat? Even you, JR. But I suppose the Wogan cartoon doesn't actually tell us much because it was in fact part of a fictional daydream I had while gazing out of this window. This line between fiction and fact on television used to be clearly marked until it began to leave such familiar territory behind to move into new, less concrete areas. Viewers generally believed what they saw on screen even though TV occasionally told entertaining fibs such as the famous panorama report on the Italian spaghetti harvest. But in 1977, Anglia TV went several leagues further with Alternative 3, a sophisticated hour-long hoax in the style of an existing documentary strand called Science Report. It made eerily convincing claims that a shadowy cabal of scientists and world governments were conspiring to build a habitable base on the surface of Mars, and it ended with what purported to be footage of a US-Soviet Martian landing in 1962, culminating in something creepy wriggling around beneath the Martian soil. God, what is that? Something moving. Something moved there. What the hell is that? But the row that followed Alternative 3 was nothing compared to the stink left behind after the BBC's Ghost Watch. Although scripted, Ghost Watch took the form of a live supernatural TV special fronted by several familiar well-loved faces, Michael Parkinson, Mike Smith and Sarah Green. But it also played host to a more sinister and unsettling presence. Boom! I bet that's scared you, isn't it? No, this is not a mask. This is Craig Charles Live, <laughs> you lucky people. Oh, and there was also a ghost, an evil spirit known as Mr Pipes, who, it was alleged, was causing simply dreadful goings-on in a North London home. At the time, viewers weren't accustomed to this kind of verite horror, and as all hell quite literally broke loose on location, and things grew increasingly horrible in the studio, the repeated fleeting appearances of Mr Pipes, seen here in the bedroom, here reflected in the glass, and here on CCTV, left many viewers genuinely terrified out of their wits. <laughs> 